case. The, the one concept of minimum sentencing, meaning that if a certain crime happens, you have to give a certain level, right? That was a direct uh, result of this case. And this concept of family members being able to testify during the sentencing phase, that's something that did not happen before this case either. But I think because the mother traveled around the country and talked about her loss, I think that people understood that, you know, if somebody's murdered or if there's a major crime that happens, you have to get a full picture of the family's uh, loss too to sort of, um, you know, it's not appropriate to doing it during the um, trial phase, but during the sentencing phase, you know, it's fair to do. And so that came out of this case too. So a lot of victim rights act um, things came out of this case too. So. Um, hmm. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, um, I think there's a lot of reasons for it. I mean, I can only speak for myself is that, you know, maybe sometimes as Asian Americans, we don't talk about our own history in this country. You know, um, maybe uh, uh, it also has to do with the fact that most Asian Americans um, around these days either weren't born yet or weren't living in this country. So to a certain degree, our community did, doesn't even know our own history because they're not taught it. I mean, and certainly, I mean, if you look at the uh, education system, they're not very good at talking about you know, the experience of minorities in this country, right? And so I think that all plays into it. I mean, really, it's the education system, but if the education system isn't stepping in, then our own community sort of needs to remember our stories, both good and bad, and I think that in some ways our community isn't as good about doing that too. Um, you know, you think about some other communities and some of the civil rights struggles that they go through, right? Like the Jewish American community and the Holocaust, you know, uh, the African American community and the four girls uh, in the church. I mean, they remember their history or, or gays and lesbians and Matthew Shepard, right? They, they, they remember the history, not as a point to whine or whatever, but to remember, you know, that, that things could happen and that as communities, they have to be vigilant against, you know, hate crimes and other things like that. And so, um, you know, maybe as Asian Americans, we need to do a better job of sort of, you know, remembering our own history. Um, and so that's part of it, too, I think. Oh, thank you. Uh, just temporarily, you mean? Um, I think that sometimes uh, maybe it's uh, I, maybe they should speak up and ask you know how how do they feel? Um, you know I would guess that because uh, you know maybe they don't understand the experiences of Asian Americans. You know maybe that gives them ex uh, a sense of what's it like to be an Asian actually growing up here um, and and things the experience that we might encounter here. I would guess um, and maybe that will help them with their own experience here as they try to deal with some issues. Um, that may be new to them, like maybe, you know, particularly if they're coming from a majority culture, right, where they're now suddenly the minority, that might be a different experience for them. They might not be able to understand how that hap happens or how to deal with it emotionally, right? But if they see that other people have gone through it too, maybe they might, you know, not feel as isolated about it or feel like there's an outlet to sort of talk about that stuff. But again, I, I can only guess because I don't, you know, I don't know what they're really thinking, but. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly, that's the shocking thing to us, because like I said, I mean, does everybody know the difference between manslaughter and murder? I mean, manslaughter is basically accidental. I mean, murder is basically you have an intent to kill. That's the difference, right? And so, uh, again, we were all just dumbfounded when that verdict came in, because again, as we talked about in the film, you know, the Asian American community, uh, and specifically the Chinese American community, um, you know, when, when Vincent was murdered, you know, we were all really, really sad, but at the same time, we all just assumed that something, that these guys would go to jail, right? And we all just waited for a whole year. We just followed the case. We got regular updates. You know, people would talk about it and stuff like that. And then when the verdict came out that these guys were not going to go to jail and there was only a $3,000 fine, that's when we were all, like, in shock. Like, wait, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Why are they not going to jail? And at that point, it was like a steep learning curve for, for specifically the Chinese-American community because nobody had protested up until that point. When he died, nobody protested. There was not a single political action that was done. It only happened after the verdict came about. And, and I think Asian-Americans realized that they were not seen equally uh, in the justice system, and perhaps maybe this this judge uh, gave such a lenient sentence because he didn't think there would be any punishment. He didn't think there would be a uh, a pushback from the Asian American community because his 
bigger fear probably was the pushback from the automotive industry and like the white uh, the white auto workers you know who are suffering in their opinion you know from from the uh, Japanese cars and so you know if you're not perceived as 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 a community that can push back it's a lot easier to sort of take advantage of you I think and um, yeah, again it was only because the sentence was so light that uh, the community even um, decided to act and sometimes I wonder if if the killers had gotten even like two years or a year you know would anything have been done and I probably and I think that probably nothing would have been done you know but I think it's because they got zero they didn't spend a single night in jail that I think that they really felt like something had to be done in this particular instance so Yeah, uh, well, unfortunately, they're still alive. Um, you know, one of them lives in Nevada. Uh, he's basically, the dad, the guy who actually swung the bat, is basically moved to Nevada because he said he was never going to pay a single cent to this family. I think he paid, paid his first check, but that was it, uh, a small percentage of it. And then, um, you know, he moved to Nevada where they have really, really lax reporting laws um, in terms of income, and he's never reported any income because as soon as he reports income, it has to be taken to pay the settlement. So he's worked under the table all this time. And the son did pay his portion, but he was less culpable because he's not the one who actually swung the bat. Um, so, you know, we thought about whether or not to include them in this film or not, but, um, you know, we ultimately decided we wanted to leave with a more positive message about community empowerment and to feature somebody who had not learned, you know, from their own past, um, you know, would be a bad message. Uh, because in some ways, I mean, ultimately, the biggest victim is Vincent Chin and his family, but in some ways, he's made himself a victim, too, because he's never was be able, went on with his own life. Um, even though he got away with murder, he never uh, wanted to apologize, never wanted to make any amends. But um, thanks to the Internet, if you want to find out where he lives, you can Google his name and find out exactly where he lives. You know, people ask me if I want to make another documentary, and I usually say no. <laughs> uh, this is what, actually a real departure for me, because I usually do scripted stuff, narrative stuff, you know, where you create your own characters. But I decided to do this project because it was a personal project for me. I mean, you know, it was really connected, you know, to, um, you know, something that happened to me personally. Uh, but you're right, there are great stories stories and important stories out there that are just not being covered by other people and it is uh, important for the community to sort of step up and document our own history because if nobody else is doing it we've got to do it ourselves and thankfully um, you know it's become a lot cheaper for people to sort of do that I mean the main obstacles to getting into film and television have always been you know production costs and distribution costs and production costs have really gone down because of inexpensive cameras you know, uh, colleges having them where you could just borrow them. And thankfully now due to the internet, distribution costs have come down too. So hopefully that will encourage more, you know, uh, minorities, people of color, gays and lesbians, women, whoever feels like their story hasn't been told will now have a better chance to sort of go out and, and tell their own story because it really, really is quite easy. I mean, you know, for us, I mean, this project was sort of a dream project. I mean, and since it, from what I've heard from other documentary filmmakers, everything, went well, <laughs> you know, like we found funding from foundations, you know, right away, you know, schools have been booking us and interested in, in hearing the story, um, but, you know, I'm sure there are lots of other stories out there too that would be just as successful. It's just, you know, having that passion and, and um, that perspective, you know, to, to tell that tale. And I'm sure there are people out there who can do a good job of it, um, just not me, so. <laughs> Uh, not really protest. I mean, you know, the, the, the most things that I remembered, um, cause my parents both, you know, they ran a restaurant, so they had to work all the time. Um, but you know, I remember them going to the hospital and visiting him. My uncle was, you know, his, in his wedding party. So, you know, I was, you know, our families were close. I'm not related to him, but in terms of the actual protesting, um, no, I don't remember my mom 
carrying a sign or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was actually, if you look at class issues, I mean, it was more the college-educated class of people that were, you know, leading a lot of the demonstrations and stuff like that. My, my family was a little bit more blue-collar, so, you know. Um, but they were definitely supportive of it. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's always an effort, but I don't know how conservative, concerted an effort it is, and I don't know how successful it is, particularly when you see the backlash that's happening in American education these days, and some of you professors can talk about it. Not only do you have states like Arizona, which are now outlawing ethnic studies program, but you have a state of... Um, you know, Texas, right? This is a big controversy because th the uh, School Board of Education uh, in Texas um, wants to rewrite their history books and eliminate things like, you know, the discussion of the Japanese internment camp or to reframe it as into, like, guest hotels or something like that, you know? Uh, and it matters because the state of Texas buys all their books together, right? So uh, if you're a publisher, you're going to bend to whatever Texas wants. Right? And so they're in the process of sanitizing that history. So if anything, I think it's even more challenging now to sort of get the history of you know, Asian Americans and people of color in general into the, the, the textbook because there is a backlash against you know, um, you know, minorities, you know, particularly since Obama's been elected, it seems. You know, there's you know, outward hostility um, towards, towards certain communities. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting, though, because, you know, at the University of Texas, one of the first programs that they cut was the Vietnamese language program. Hello, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's where your students are coming from. I mean, you know, why would you cut one of the most popular programs, except maybe because it hasn't been around as long, maybe they don't have the strong institutional support or longevity with it? I'm not sure why, but, you know, it just doesn't make sense, because particularly if you look at the population trends of where your students are going to be coming from, you know, in the large Vietnamese American population in Houston and, and, you know, throughout Texas, why would you cut that program, you know? So, uh... I don't know why people make certain decisions. You guys might know better because you guys work on college campuses. Is there any reason for the decisions they make? Yeah, and what's even more shocking is the states of California and Texas are already majority minority, right? You would think they would include more Latino history, right? Not less, you know, and particularly for Asian Americans, you would think they would be more. You know, the, I know the, the, the adult population of Asian Americans is over 10%, like 12% now. I would guess the, the uh, student age population is quite higher than that too. So why would you not be trying to appeal to these students as opposed to like, you know, eliminating these these things it just doesn't make sense I there and there no you, you first and then okay Yeah. 
Me personally? <laughs> I live in California. Um, uh, I mean, hopefully, I mean, you know, but that's part of what we're trying to do with the film is to encourage young people to get involved. I mean, we try to leave with a positive message that you can have an impact, um, you know, but it has to be a grassroots effort, right? Um, and fortunately, with new technology, it's a lot easier for communities to organize themselves, right? And eventually, you'll be able to bypass uh, larger entities and things like that. But, um, you know, I... In Texas, yeah. 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 Well, you know, it's interesting because when I first started touring around, you know, a lot of students would ask me, "Well, now that we have an African American president, why do we still need to talk about race?" You know, and I'm like, uh, "Have you been following the Tea Party?" You know, it's like they say the most racist things, like you know, Obama not being born in America. Would that happen to anybody but a minority president? Do you know what I mean? Uh, you know, and they and and the other side just foments it. They don't they don't stop it. You know, and I think that's part of the thing is like we have to create a culture where if racism happens, you need to call it out. You need to call it for what it is. Otherwise, you let situations like the Vincent Chin murder happen. Because in Detroit at that time period, it was very very um, uh, common to hear anti-Asian things. You know, and I specifically remember my parents warning me to say, "Hey, be careful," right? because people are, are not as friendly towards Asians anymore. You know, and, and um, you know, it's because if you watch TV, you'd see the politicians saying anti-Asian things. You know, if you saw commercials, you'd see Asian things, you know, being beaten by hammers or having giant monster trucks roll over them. I mean, and that's violence, you know. Yes, it's violence towards a, a material object, but what's to, if someone has so much anger, you know, and they see an image of an Asian thing being destroyed, what's to stop them from taking the next logical step and saying, you know, if I can destroy a Japanese car, why can't I just kill a Japanese, right? Which is basically his, you can see how that logic probably worked in his head, you know, and it's because nobody stood up for it. No politicians, there were no Asian American advocacy groups back then saying, hey, you, you know, this uh, anti-Asian rhetoric is unacceptable. There was nothing out there. You know, um, and fortunately, we do have some groups out there now who are starting to sort of respond back. We need to get better at it, but at least we have some form of a skeletal infrastructure now. Um, but yeah, every t anytime you hear something, you got to stand up. You got to call it out. I think. This subject's really depressing. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things I do is I talk about how how um, you know uh, um, easy it is sort of make the film to encourage young people to, if you have an idea in this room and you feel like doing it, by all means just pick up a camera and doing it. On a more practical level, I'm actually working with um, a couple of friends of mine, um, you know, uh, other writers of color who've worked in Hollywood on, on network shows and we're going to start a non-profit, you know, to fund web series productions for uh, 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 artists of color or young filmmakers who want to do a web series that has a minority point of view. Um, so th that's where I feel like I can help. I can help the next generation of storytellers uh, get the resources to tell their own story. Like, you know, we have network executives who can give you advice in terms of how to develop a, net, uh, a, a web series, right? I mean, so that's what I, I think where I feel like I can help. So I'm not totally abandoning things, you know what I mean? But, you know, it's really strange for me because, like, prior to this, I was just writing TV comedy, you know, and, like, then I'm delving into, like, this whole thing about hate crimes and, you know, this whole learning curve. And, you know, um, it's been great because it's empowering to sort of see Asian Americans out there, but I also feel like, you know, 
I feel like I, I tried to help with this, you know, and hopefully there are other people that can also give. And that's all you can ask from everybody. Everybody sort of gives what they feel like they want to give and what they're capable of giving. But you're definitely right about, you know, um, controlling your own message because one of the things I find really, really interesting is that, you know, um, as people of color, a lot of times we're not given that uh, authority or that ability or that luxury to tell our own stories. And in fact, whenever we tell our own stories, people question the authentic authenticity because they say it's biased, right? Right? But isn't any time anybody writes their own history a little bit biased? I mean, if, when white people write their history, it's a little biased, and we accept it, right? You know, but why don't people of color get that same type of leeway to say that our scholarship, you know, is as... as um, important or as reasoned or as well thought out or whatever, right? And that's why we just have to go out and do it, you know, and, and, you know, damn the critics or whatever. You know, go out, tell our own stories, follow up on it, you know, and we will find that audience for it. And so, you know, that's what I try to do. I just try to encourage young people. So hopefully you have an idea for a story. Do you have a story that you want to tell? No? Okay. Well, hopefully you do. Okay. Oh, that they sided with them? With the Evans family? Yeah, but you know, I met people like that when I was a kid, you know, because, you know, obviously, uh, you know, um, if your family worked in the auto industry, right, and especially if they worked on the lines, you know, you had their family obviously had more simpatico with those, the, the killers, right, because they sense of frustration. Even if they didn't condone murdering somebody, they could still say like, well, you know, those damn Japs are really, you know, doing something unfair, you know. So I encountered that as a kid all the time when that case was going on. Um, you know, moving forward now, not so much. I mean, um, I don't have people doing that anymore. Um, I mean, truthfully, most people haven't heard about the case, so that's probably the, you know, like the most common thing is like, oh, wow, I never heard about this. You know, that's probably the most common reaction. Um, and then the, the second most common reaction is, why didn't I hear about it? You know, what's wrong with the education system? Why are we not hearing about these stories? So those are probably the two most common responses. So. What? Yeah. I don't know. Do you watch bad television? <laughs> 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 yeah. It's nothing. It's nothing proud to write, write home about. But you know, like network fair, like. Schlocky sitcoms. The most recent show I worked on was According to Jim. You know, it's that, it's that type of stuff. So, yeah. What do you think was said around the generation that was around in the civil rights movement about the Um, That's a good question. Um, huh. I think that there were some things that were very unique about this case as to why it did spread out, you know, and included a lot of different people. Um, you know, for one thing, prior to this, keep in mind that this is, you're talking the early 1980s, and the Asian American population was much, much smaller, right? Like less than 1% of the country, really small. And the demographics of it was far different. Back then, it was primarily Chinese and Japanese American, and, you know, a, a large but smaller amount of Filipino Americans. It was really those three groups. These days, you know, the largest Asian American groups in order, I think, are the Chinese, then the Filipinos, then the Indian Americans, and then the uh, Vietnamese Americans, then Korean, and then Japanese American, right? So it's a totally different dynamic now. So back then, it really was just those three groups in large numbers. And the Chinese and the Japanese hated each other because of all the stuff that happened, you know, during World War II. And it was still fresh in their memory. They did not like each other. Um, and I think because of the unique nature of this case, where it was an anti-Japanese sentiment, right, because, and that, the Japanese American community was already on the alert for that, but because a Chinese American had been murdered, you know, that energized the, Asian, uh, the Chinese American communities. And, you know, in Michigan, the largest Asian American population is the Indian American community, you know, but there's also a sizable Filipino American community. So I think it was all these various factors which sort of made that case unique. And I think it was also this recognition that, hell, if they can't tell us apart, we may as well work together, right? And so, um, you know, so 
I think there were a lot of unique things about this case that sort of made it happen at that time. You know, would, would there have been another case that would have uh, had the same effect further down the line? Who knows, maybe. Maybe the LA riots would have gotten Asian Americans together, who knows. Um, but again, there, there, are, there are countless hate crimes that happen all the time. You know, people are murdered because of their race, sexual orientation, gender, you know, religion, gender all the time, right? It's, but the question is, why do some cases actually strike a chord? Why do we remember some more than others? Um, and again, I think that this one really struck a chord for us because of those factors I just talked about, but, but it really struck a chord with a larger mainstream audience because it had to do with America's own sense of its own uh, industrial prowess. It was really tied into the death of the, Ameri the dying of the American auto industry, and that's why people had a hook into understanding it. You know, they had a perspective on it. If it was just, you know, like an, a, a random Asian American who was murdered because of their race, but had nothing to do with the auto industry, you know, I don't think it would have gotten as much news coverage, right? But it had to have some hook for the media to sort of like cover it, right? Um, just like with Matthew Shepard, having the image of him, you know. Um, you know, like a, in almost like a Christ-like thing, where you know, that struck a chord too. There's always something about a particular case that sort of like captures the imagination, and um, you know, but there are murders happening all the time. And it's just a question of why do some, you know, you remember and some you don't. So. <laughs> this one, do you want me to model? Um, <laughs> Uh, you can order online at a company called Black Lava. If you guys don't know them, they're really, really great. Uh, they actually distribute our DVD too, but they actually have a lot of uh, cool Asian American, you know, stuff. So Black Lava. Mm -hmm. I really want to know a, a little bit about what happened after the, the first uh, trial of, uh, of Jason Hedges. Um, there was a retrial, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, uh, I'm not a lawyer, again, so, uh, <laughs> you know. But in terms of it, basically, you guys know there's always a criminal case and a civil case, right? You guys are old enough to remember O.J. Simpson, right? So, like, if there's a criminal case and someone is found innocent, right, or whatever charges, whatever, you can't retry them, right? There's double jeopardy type stuff. But you can not try them in the civil case, which is exactly what happened with the O.J. Simpson case. They had to then pursue the civil route. Now, what was challenging for this particular case is prior to this, all hate crimes in America was just African-American and white, right? This is the first case that expanded that definition, and uh, it was a struggle for them to consider it because they didn't have a concept of racism against Asian Americans. But fortunately, because of it, they've expanded the definition now to include other minorities, gays and lesbians, um, gender, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other things. So that is another significance of this case. It really expanded the definition of hate crimes. So what they had to do was they had to appeal it to the next level, which was then the federal level. Um, and uh, uh, Michigan is in the district that, in, that is housed in Cincinnati, Ohio. So they actually had to move the trial down to Cincinnati. And that's where the trouble began because, you know, Cincinnati is culturally a very different city than Detroit. Uh, do you guys know Cincinnati? Has anybody ever been there? I mean, it's really a southern city, right? And, and it's a really white city. So I don't think they understand race relations even as well as Detroit misunderstands it or whatever. And, um, you know, unfortunately, Vincent's side did have some bad lawyering. I mean, so it wasn't perfect. They weren't the greatest lawyers. But again, I mean, it was a case that was on nobody's radar screen. There were no Asian American civil rights groups to speak of at that time to, to fight for them. And so it was really a bunch of 20-year-old lawyers Asian Americans, you know, that were really pushing this. But that also gives you guys inspiration that these, these were people that were not much older than you, you know, like maybe three or four years older than you, and they were able to, like, you know, achieve this, um, you know. Uh, and, um, you know, so what happened out of that with the criminal, uh, with the civil case is that they, um, they came out to some settlement, but they were found innocent of violating the civil rights, you know. Um, and so uh, there's not much else you could do at this point. At, at, at this point, the only thing that, that the Vincent Chin side can do is they can um, renew the settlement every 10 years so that if this guy ever comes into money or when he dies, he has to pay his uh, fine plus whatever interest has accrued um, from there. But uh, yeah, there's, there's not much hope for that. So there's really not much you can do at this point, unfortunately.
Oh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. While making the film or while touring it? <laughs> Those are two different issues. Um, yeah, you know, it's really interesting because when I started making it, it was a really, really personal project. It was just something I thought I would take some time off and just sort of like get out of Hollywood to do, you know, just sort of clear my head. Um, you know, my dad had passed away, and so that's why I went home. Um, and, uh, you know, so I didn't really have a goal in that sense of, of or like, uh, I didn't sit down and think like, well, where's the Asian American community is on, where do I want it to be afterwards? But what I was amazed was the, the uh, uh, accessibility of all these people that wanted to be a part of this. I mean, we had people coming out of the woodwork saying, hey, I hear you're doing an update of this case. You know, how can I be a part of it? You know, uh, everybody that we asked to be in the film said yes, except for one person who shall remain nameless. Um, you know, uh, but yeah, it was just really great to see so many people to say that they were inspired by this case and remain inspired by this case um, to do civil rights work. So that made me feel good, you know, so that it hadn't been completely forgotten. So that even if the majority of people didn't know about this case, that the people who do hear about it, they're inspired by it to want to um, do something good. Um, so that made me feel good. Uh, in terms of traveling around, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's been kind of cool to see Asian Americans all over the country. I mean, like, you know, in Alabama and Kansas and other places like that. And I feel sorry for them, but, um, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Iowa, you know. Um, but, you know, it's just kind of exciting, too, to sort of see that Asian Americans are a fabric of this whole country. You know, I mean, as someone who grew up in the Midwest, I've always known this because there is this perception that Asian Americans are pretty much on the coast, right? And, you know, I'm always always thinking, no, we're from the Midwest too. My family's been here since the 1920s in the Midwest, you know? I mean, you know, they came here in the 1800s, but we're on the West Coast, but they somehow got stuck in Ohio, you know? <laughs> uh, and, you know, that's a very unique experience, but I think that's also great because it's also a uniquely American experience too. So that's made me feel good is, you know, um, connecting with Asian Americans in the Midwest and sort of, you know, making our case that we've always been part of this country. We've always contributed when we were allowed to contribute. And I do think that Asian Americans would have contributed even more to this country if we were not prevented from doing so because of racist immigration laws. I think that Asian Americans would have wanted to, you know, contribute to this country and the building of this country, but we were not afforded that opportunity. Um, so that's a shame. Um, because I do think that we, we bring a lot of value to this country, and I think that we contribute a lot, and we have, and we continue to do so. There and then there. Uh huh. Great. How did we know to reach out to them? Well, I actually knew them beforehand, so you know it was just easy to just say, "Hey, work on this," and they were like, "Hey, yeah, we want to do it." The Asian American community is very, very small. We all kind of know each other, <laughs> you know, like particularly out in Hollywood. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, but in terms of the experts and other, I mean, there were obviously some people we had to pursue, like Helen Zia and the lawyers that were involved with the case. Uh, in terms of the young people that were inspired by the case, we put a call out. You know, and people send it out to listserv saying, hey, were you an Asian American that grew up in Michigan in the 80s? You know, do you want to talk about your perspective of the Vincent Chin case? And, you know, um, we didn't get a lot of people responding back to that, but we felt like the people that we did find we were very, very happy with. Um, you know, so uh, that's sort of how we did it. Um, but the thing that I have learned about filmmaking, independent filmmaker in, in particular, is that there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. I mean, you will find a way to make your, uh, to get your story out there, right? If you're, if, you're, if you're passionate enough about it and if you're willing to be creative about it and to willing to um, you know, try things out, out of the norm, you can get your story out there. Um, it really, really, really is much more possible these days to sort of do it. Again, the finances are gonna be different than working for the studios, right? But you'll get to tell more interesting stories. And isn't that what it's about at the end of the day, right? So, you have a story here? Yeah. 
Yeah, I see no reason why young people shouldn't learn about their history. I mean, maybe you don't want to teach them the violent, negative stuff to begin with, but you definitely want to think of, you know, talking about the positive contributions that all different people have made in this country. I think that's just better for all of us, you know, whether you're a minority or not. It's good to have a, a good, positive perspective how various people from across this globe, including people that were already here, help build this country, right? I mean, it just makes us all smarter and, and better aware of our own history, you know, no matter what race you're from. As an Asian American, I want to know the contributions of African Americans, of Italian Americans, you know, of, of Latinos. You know, I think that's important because it helps me contextualize the contributions of Asian Americans myself, right? So I think that it's always important and you should start that definitely young. In terms of screening this film, I actually just got invited to my first high school, uh, Exeter, in, but it's a private school, so I don't know if that's what you're talking about. <laughs> um, but no, I haven't really done that yet. Uh, it's been mostly colleges and a few corporations and law firms and things like that. Yeah. But um, we will give away uh, copies to high schools. You know, um, you know, I think we're planning to do that like around January, February. We'll give away some free copies. You know, so if you know local schools like Ames High School that wants one, you know, we'll get them a copy. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think this would make a good screenplay, if that's what you're asking. Is that, is that what you're saying? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, your first question. What was your first question? Oh, but personal? You know what was actually the most... I actually have to say that the most, pers the most emotional aspect for me was actually being back in Detroit. Because, you know, I love that city. I think it's one of the great American cities. And I feel really, really bad that it's gone downhill and that it just doesn't, um, that it's going through so many challenges. So going back to Detroit when we did the filming in Detroit, traveling around the streets of Detroit that I grew up in, that, that was really sad for me. I mean, in terms of Vincent, he wasn't a, he was much older than me. So I didn't really know him personally. So I don't have that. I vaguely remember him as being like the older kid. You know how the cool kids are older and they're in the kung fu groups and stuff like that, you know, and you're that little punky kid who's, you know, watches them from afar. So that was sort of me. Um, so I didn't really know him, but, you know, I definitely knew Detroit and I felt Detroit and I felt like this story was just as, as equally about Detroit too for me. Um, so that was emotional. Um, in terms of scripting it, um, I have not thought of scripting anything like that, but I do write, I mean, that's what, that's how I make my living as a screenwriter. You know, um, so I do write other stuff, but they generally aren't this heavy in, in subject matter. Um, I don't know if I would. Hmm? You lighter. Yeah, definitely, much lighter. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Are you scratching or asking a question? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can go here first. No, there's nothing. <laughs> what? Uh, you know, that's part of the thing is that the group that formed this was a group called American Citizens for Justice. And, you know, they, um, after this case, they actually you know, got to the point where they had staffing and an office and stuff like that. But, you know, because of maybe the hardship of Detroit and what other factors, that organization no longer has an office, no longer has staff, has a very, very minimal budget. So they're not in that capacity. And part of the proceeds for this film is we fund, you know, their activities now. I mean, because we want, you know, them to be able to do the work that they want to do. And so we donate money to them to sort of continue on. Um, they have done quite a few screenings of the film, you know. Uh, uh, probably I mean, just like six or seven, you know. So I feel like that is helping them keep the memory alive, particularly for even a lot of people in Michigan who've never heard about the case. Um, but as for an annual thing, I'm not sure. I know that the uh, AAAS, the Association of Asian American Studies, is planning to do a big thing 
uh, on the 30th anniversary, and I know that the, Amer the Asian American Journalists Association is having their conference in Detroit next year, and they're going to make the Vincent Chin case a centerpiece. And that's actually how they got the conference to, to uh, be in Detroit, because they build it as the uh, birthplace of the Asian American movement. Otherwise, why else would you have a conference in Detroit, right? So uh, they're actually going to be uh, doing a lot of stuff around that, I think. So, um, you know, hopefully uh, people will remember the case. And, you know, film makes it easier, right? So. Did you have enough time to write, think of your question? Uh, it's not a complicated, so I'm trying to figure out how to say it in a more fair way. Okay. Um, I remember I was watching uh, the Charlie and the Messiah. Yeah. Um, on the Blood Fake movie. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, um, I remember in your interview you saying there's like 14 million Asian Americans in the US. I'm not sure. Um, so, like, are those stats? I'm sorry, I don't know how to phrase them. Do you think that the Asian American Uh, yeah, is it fragmented? Yeah. yeah, is there really an Asian American community, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I get asked that question. I mean, is it just a fake arbitrary thing created by the census, which it was, um, or is there really truly an Asian American culture that's being out there, you know? And the answer with, that I sort of talk about is like, you know, um, you can try to create a, an Asian American movement, right, or a community for strategic persons reasons, right, and political reasons, right? But that's... That's the problem with politics. Politics is a lot of times in your head. What you need to sort of move people is sort of what's in the heart, and that's where culture and things like come in. So if you're gonna see the development of an Asian American political movement, you have to see the cultural movement happening first, okay? So um, I do think there is the start of it, you know, and it's really kind of interesting to me. It's in a very, very formative state, right? Very, very nascent, and, and it varies depending on what region. But, um, you know, one of the areas that I would sort of think of is looking at, at Asian Americans around your age, right? And do you guys feel that you guys have a lot in common with each other, with other Asian Americans on different campuses? Are you able to reach out to them? When you watch America's Best Dance Group, do you feel like, hey, that's an Asian American? You know what I mean? Do you, does that ring a bell with you? You know what I mean? Or if you have a boba. I mean, these are really stupid, superficial things, but they actually do matter. Because what you're doing is you're, sh you're creating a shared history, a shared identity. And therefore, when a political uh, situation arises, you know, you're not going to have to question, why am I here standing next to this Vietnamese American? You're going to think, like, all right, we're in this together. You know, we have shared identity and stuff like that. So I think it's a little bit easier right now between Asian Americans, I mean, East Asians and uh, Southeast Asians. I think with South Asian Americans, I think it might take a little bit more work, but I do think that there are enough commonalities, you know, that eventually it'll happen, particularly as the experiences of second, third, and fourth generation Asian Americans of East Asian, Southeast Asian, and South Asian uh, in this country becomes more similar, right, uh, to each other, because you'll see that happening. So I think it's a, a, a work in progress, but I definitely see the, the beginnings of it, you know, particularly in places like California, you know, and Hawaii. Um, maybe not so much in Iowa yet, but, you know, uh, you know, maybe in about 20 years or so. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. And I think that that's one of the things about the internet is that, you know, when, you know, if you look at the history of media in America, starting with television, you know, how you originally had three major channels, right? And it was very, very limited who were the decision makers. And then they expanded out to cable, right? And then more people got their stuff, right? So then when you had cable, BET came about, right? And, um, you know, gays and lesbians got their channel, and women got their own channel. You know, everybody got their channel except for Asian Americans, right? And even though you have serious radio, which would be very, very easy to give Asian Americans a channel on that, we don't have one. But what you do sort of see happening is, is on the Internet, where you go to YouTube and you see the most popular uh, uh, artists on there are Asian Americans. I mean, Niga Higa has 2.5 million subscribers. I mean, you can question the, the quality of his content, but he has 2.5 million people watching them, right? So that's pretty good. And so the guy makes six figures easily, you know, doing that stuff. I mean, it's, again, that's still not Hollywood money, but still, that's good money for just sitting at home making videos, right? Um, you know, and so you see it starting, and so yeah, I think you'll you'll see it happening. Um, there were a couple attempts. Um, Comcast tried to do an Asian American channel, but it folded, I think, two years ago. Um, and then there was an independent firm that tried to create something called Asian TV, 
uh, and it eventually got bought up by a Korean company right now. So there have been attempts, but they just have not. I think it's always been the quality of the programming that's really sunk it, as opposed to the lack of an audience. It's because you do have to put a lot of money into developing quality project, and I, I don't think they did that. So, but there are r you know rumblings of it. So, and eventually you'll see something. It just may not be a, a, a in the form that you see right now because media is changing itself, and you'll see it more at the forefront of the changes in media itself. So, are you going to create your own show? Are you going to create your own show? Uh, so yeah. I'll think about that. Oh, good. <laughs> we'll write it down. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I think so. Okay, well, maybe Thank you. Not just your own show, but your other channel. Maybe we'll start here. Yes. Uh, on behalf of uh, the growing uh, Asian American community gathered here and uh, beyond, I want to thank Curtis Chin for coming to Iowa State University, for making this mm -hmm. room, for bringing back the memory of uh, this important case and to change the history of civil rights in the United States. And uh, I also want to thank him for uh, the inspiration and uh, the guidance and, and the new ideas that he brings to, to our growing community. And so uh, I want to remind everybody that uh, Curtis Chin will be speaking again tomorrow, uh, September 28th, Tuesday, at the M Shop at 3 o'clock on the subject of marriage equality. And uh, you can continue the discussion with him there. Also, I'd like to remind everybody that we have some refreshments, some delicious uh, gourmet uh, cupcakes and some wonderful punch. And uh, so you can continue your discussion with Curtis Chin over, uh, over the hood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.